All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Nikki Winslow. I'm the district director here for the Altadena Library District. Um, excited to have such a great turnout today. And I think we have, what, 20 people on Zoom with us too, David? Put them on the spot, sorry. But <laughs> lots of participation, which is wonderful. Um, so this is our very first look at the main library uh, schematic design. I do want to emphasize that like nothing is set in stone. We've been working with our architectural firm, um, Anderson Brule Architects. We're joined today by Mark, our lead architect. Hi, Mark, if you want to wave. Um, he'll be presenting initially to show you like our early renderings and schematics with main library, but it's been an absolute priority of mine as well as our board of trustees. And we're joined today by trustee, our board president, Jason Capel, and our uh, wonderful trustee, Katie Clark, who are also on the facilities committee with me. Um, we, we want to have as many voices involved from early on in the process to make sure that we're building in input and feedback about what people want to see, not only in terms of like maintaining historical integrity of the library, but what kind of programming and services we want to see as we build that into this design. I'm sure many of you know the library turned 55 last year. And it's really our full intention to take these bond proceeds that have been entrusted to us by the taxpayers in Altadena and have this building relevant for another 55 years plus. So anything you guys wanna add before we kick off? Just that, you know, today is sort of the first time we're rolling out some of these designs. Um, they're still in a very conceptual place. So if you see something and you're like, I don't like that color, or that tree seems weird, like totally, I agree. Um, but what we're really hoping to get from um, this, this conversation with you all today and then the follow-up conversation, we're going to be doing the same thing on Wednesday, is a sense of like big picture, are we on the right track? Is this making sense? Do you feel like we're headed in the right direction? Um, and please throw out as many things as you can think of, because even if we're not at that stage of, of implementing them right now in the schematic design, we'll want to know for further detail. Thank you guys so much for being here. Amazing. Yeah, definitely. So kind of the way things are going to go, uh, we're going to have Mark um, present about many of the things you can see on the boards over here against the wall. Um, but really the, the big thing we wanna do is leave lots of time for questions and comments and feedback. And I'm gonna be scribing and writing those down. We also have um, Jennifer Pearson, who's been working with us. Um, she's from Rackland Partners, which is the capital project management firm that we started working with in the beginning of 2020, right? So we've been, we hired them as soon as we passed the ballot measure in the end of 2020 to oversee the process of both library renovations. So just so you are aware, we've had 76 meetings already to get us to this point. We meet every Monday as the facilities committee with Rackland Partners. Jason and Katie have both been on the facilities committee these last two years. So again, lots of time and thought are going into these library designs because we absolutely want to get it 100% right um, and spend this money as responsibly and in the most transparent way that we possibly can. I was just thinking you might want to mention that all throughout this process, you've had a whole community That's a good point. giving you feedback. Right. It's not just you guys and the architects, but you've involved the whole community. Yeah, community. thank you, Bridget, for pointing that out. So about a year ago, um, we went into contract with Anderson Brule Architects. They're going to be designing both the Bob Lucas design as well as the main library design. In addition to that, we put together what we've called our community focus group, and we have these uh, representation from all of our community stakeholder groups, including Altadena Heritage, Altadena Historical Society, Town Council, um, the Friends, the Foundation, and then just some at-large community members as well. Uh, who's on the focus group that's here so I can point you out? Tom yeah. Riley, Bridget Brewster. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so Rob Bruce. Yeah, Rob Bruce represents, but yeah, so again, like we've already run, we met with them in the middle of December yeah. and showed these renderings as well and built in some feedback around that as well. But again, like as we have been designing Bob Lucas, we've been meeting with that group as well. 
So again, trying to build as much feedback into the process as we possibly can and are really grateful to all the people that are willing to put the time in to help us have a really informed design process. So I think I'll turn it over to Mark and Mark will be speaking through the speaker. So hopefully everyone can yes, hear. Yes, hopefully you all can hear me. Is is it uh, is it audible? Yes, <laughs> yes. All right. Good, we so go. um, I will start off by saying that there's something about a building that is uh, younger than you are that's up for historic uh, preservation issues. It, it makes me feel even that much older. Um, anyway, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, allowing us to present where we are with the project. Hang on, I've got to minimize um, my screen here. I apologize, I'm not uh, able to come to be there today, but I was really hoping. But um, good news is that we're, um, we're out of town celebrating my mother-in-law's 90th birthday, so. Um, I think that was a good excuse of any. So, um, but uh, as was mentioned, this is the schematic design development. That is, we're not done with schematic design. We're still doing it. Um, so this is again, an opportunity to see where we are with the plans, where we are with the design and for you to make comments. And we're not saying we can address every comment, but we wanna hear them because um, now is the time for us to understand what your needs, what you see, sometimes you guys see things uh, that we don't. Um, so I'm gonna just jump right in. And one of the first things that we do when looking at um, a project, especially a renovation such as this is, and especially with the building that we've been asked, maintain its historic, um, a bill or ability to be on the registry, we start looking at the pieces and parts of the building that become significant. Why, why do we love this building? Why is it significant as a piece of architecture beyond what it means to the community? And what we gleaned um, in looking at your project, what we've seen uh, about the, the building are a number of things. Uh, and, and you may catch these things. And when you walk out of the community room today, Take a look and you'll notice these things. But uh, the first of all is the main library is, is uh, built of a number of, of planes. And this is a very traditional modern architecture theme for lack of a better word, that you'll notice these walls that almost become freestanding that um, start defining space. One of the uh, biggest ones you have are right down by the parking lot here um, that, um, that start defining an edge. Uh, another huge part about your library is its indoor outdoor connection. You know, you stand in the main space and you see gardens, you stand uh, at this entry, you see gardens, you know, anywhere around when you look out uh, where the children's area is, you're looking, you're like in a tree house, right? So there's this real big connection to nature and mother nature. Even the way you come onto the campus or onto the library is, is is like a walk through the park, almost literally. And so we wanna make sure that that's honored and um, expressed. A couple of things though, we also look at is what's, what doesn't work for the library. And one of the things, uh, and this is from the get-go, is if you're in, down here in the parking lot, getting to the library uh, is circuitous at best mm -hmm. and impossible if you are um, uh, disabled. Um, so, you know, currently you have uh, your ADA parking up here, but even then that wayfinding is a little difficult because it's a little hidden behind, well, that wonderful landscape. But we don't want to lose that idea that the original architects had of this kind of sequence of events, this, this, uh, this opening up the building as you approach it and as you enter it, starting to find more. We want to make sure that we maintain that idea. Um, of course, the space in the middle of the, um, the library, uh, we, we kept calling the, li uh, the living room. I've been corrected more than once that, uh, and I've forgotten, Nikki, what is that? What do you guys call it again? The reading court. The reading court. That's right. Um, and, you know, that is probably one of the largest defining aspects to this project and this building, your library. Um, we have engaged with a local historic architecture firm, Historic Resources Group, located right there in Pasadena. Um, actually, the gentleman we're working for is an Altadena um, 
uh, not native, but uh, resident. So he's very, very engaged. And so everything that we've been doing, we check with him and work with him to make sure that we are doing nothing that could um, disqualify this building from being considered a historic resource. Um, one of the things, and I'll just jump right to, is as we looked at having to solve the number of problems that the library faced, both with access, as well as needing more space, specifically in the like the function you're using, the decisions was made to create additions. Um, and I apologize for how I'm drawing. I'm using my mouse, so it's it's that third grade quality that you uh, um, you're looking at. But um, one of the things is making sure that there is a clear way in. And the other aspect is that when the library isn't open everyone still feels comfortable coming to the community room. Um, let me uh, go to the next one. So I'll dive a little deeper into the floor plans in a second. Um, but again, talking about these program diagrams, your reading cord again is, is always at center. And we wanted to make sure that these special spaces that we're adding on have a relationship to that. And that relationship may be spatial, it may be visual, or maybe just one that um, tries to um, just mimic, mimic the architecture at a level. Uh, the other piece is this connection of landscape. The space you're in, you're in now is going to become a different use. And so we're looking at opening them up, opening it up with windows. You don't see it in this diagram. So we start connecting to the landscape here. The new law entrance is all about glass and glazing, but we want to make sure that the reading court has the same relationship to the exterior that it does towards the north. And of course, your community room, we want, instead of it being this kind of sequestered space that you're in now, we want it to be open to the community and we want to create that, that visual access so that people feel welcome and they don't have to feel like they're uh, you know, direct, direct entry. It's all lit at night. You know, you just feel comfortable coming into the space and won't ever have a question of where to go. And that's a real important aspect to both wayfinding and that idea of what a community, uh, community space is about. Um, landscape wise, um, one of the things that we're, uh, a couple things we're doing. One is we're creating a small plaza in front of the community room so that the functions and uses that you are using now can spill outdoors. Or if you have a very large group, that can spill outdoors. It has direct access from the exterior. Um, and again, it becomes almost, almost beacon-like at night. You know, you'll be able to see, oh, there's the community room. Um, one of the other things we're doing is able, we were able to make the parking lot a little bit narrower, which gave us some more space between the parking and the building. So that instead of parking, boom, right into the building, we'll have some of that landscape buffer that we enjoy uh, throughout, throughout the project um, uh, elsewhere. On the north side, off Mariposa, we're looking at creating a, an outdoor space that um, uh, that can be used from everything from just a reading nook, outdoor activities for children, or uh, it's an informal um, amphitheater. So maybe you do set somebody up on what is something, it looks like a stage, works like a stage, we just don't call it a stage. And then there could be an opportunity for passive seating around it. Um, one of the things, and I can share this with you in the floor plan, is the big glass wall that you have to the north of your library, we're going to make those operable windows or operable doors so that whatever's going on out here will have a direct relationship to inside. So again, for those what are currently concerts in the library, they could be concerts right outside the library, and then you can use both indoor and outdoor space. Um, we are adding some parking, uh, staff parking and, and delivery to the north. So we are touching some of that landscape, um, but we're keeping it um, kind of tucked away behind that beautiful olive tree that you see now. And we've been able to work the new um, plaza and patio space outside around 
those two jacarandas. There's another tree in there, I forgot the type, that um, it, uh, it was already identified by the arborist of being iffy. So that one we're not too concerned of keeping, but definitely that those two nice jacarandas we're gonna be keeping. The other thing you can see here is we've created a direct access so that as you're driving by, as you're walking by, you don't have this circuitous route into the library, you know, boom, here's one of the entries. And I'll talk a little about this on the um, floor plans when we, um, when we get there, because like you have now the two entries, we are maintaining those, the entrance from the south and the parking, the entrance, well, what is on the east, but it's really from the north from Mariposa. All right, so we can jump in. Um, or Nikki, do you want us to pause for questions or do you think we should get through the whole presentation? I'd say let's get through the whole thing. Too. Okay, so I'm gonna start on the upper floor and um, <laughs> you'll be surprised with how little we are doing in regards to changing the, the space. And our, our goal is really so that when you walk into the renovated library, you have to look at it critically and really think about what you've been um, experiencing to say, oh, they changed this, oh, change that. Now, saying that, part of keeping this building historically relevant, um, we are required, and this is a standard by the uh, Secretary of Interior uh, from the federal government le level, we are required that when we make changes to the building, they are obvious changes. So you can see there's a real, real challenge and dichotomy. There's, there's an idea, well, I don't want something that looks brand new. I don't want it to look alien, but we have to make sure that it, it's clear that, oh, that's, that's new. And this is from the original library. And I'll share a little with you when we start looking at images, the way we're gonna do that. But first and foremost, when you step in, into your library now, the first thing you, you feel is how open it is, right? And that it's really one big space that happens to have just one corner kind of blocked off for, for staff. Now, you've probably been, been listening to staff complain that they don't have enough space or the fact that they're downstairs when everything they need to do is upstairs. So one of the things we're doing is we're moving the staff area um, from here to the other side where the current stacks are, here where your collections are. So it almost doubles the size of staff area. And what that does is it brings all the staff to one location, which is super important from a standpoint of staffing, um, but it also frees up a lot of what's going on on the ground floor for additional community amenities. And we'll talk about those in a moment. Um, one of the other things that the, um, library has been facing is a dearth of meeting spaces. I think right now you have one um, conference room and then maybe a few offices. And the reality of what's happening in libraries today and what the needs of library users today is um, really gone beyond that one meeting room, whether it's to take a Zoom call or to meet with people or meet with a tutor or whatever you can imagine, um, there is a need to add meeting spaces. And these will range from three to four person spaces all the way up to, well, the new community room, which can hold um, 200. But uh, on the main floor, we're looking at having what would be three, three, I forget that my hands aren't sometimes seen, um, three uh, meeting rooms, one, two, and three, and you can see there are various sizes and these would be, they, they might be um, available for anyone. You might be able to check them out for a time, what have you. There are more meeting rooms downstairs, but these are the ones that are on the library floor. And you can see that everything here is just open the way that, um, the way that it is now. The area that once was the, um, staff area because it has a nice low ceiling, this is gonna become the teen area. And teens is gonna have its own 
kind of pull out space. And that might be a gaming room. It might be a, a classroom. It might be a tutoring room, those kinds of things. Um, but another aspect is that we will put in a glass wall that separates the teen area from the rest of the library, allowing them to, to have their own programs happening simultaneously in the teen area for them to act a little bit more like teens without being disruptive to the entire library. Um, but it is glass so that we can we can watch, right? We can make sure that they're not up to, up to issues. Uh, did someone have something to say? I'm sorry. I was just agreeing with you. Oh, okay, <laughs> good. So here you can see um, the uh, reading court is still there. Uh, the planters are still there. Uh, at this time, we're thinking even the tile is going to be there. We're a little concerned when we add the uh, accessibility ramp, whether we can keep it, but that would be one of our goal. That tile, like it or not, is one of the de you know, a defining element in the architecture. Those columns that you have in the library, which I dig personally as an architect and some of our other architects, maybe not, that's considered a um, defining element of the architecture. So we're keeping them and we're actually going to be celebrating in certain manners. The nature of your ceiling and the um, uh, the way that the project is or your building is lit, that's going to be maintained. You know, we talked about going to a wood ceiling. We talked about all this other stuff. And what came back was, well, it's a T-bar ceiling, which was kind of of the time. So we're going to replace it with it, but something a lot cleaner um, that that talks about the patterns there and definitely change up the lighting. So it'll be a very different nature of lighting where it doesn't feel old and, and actually energy wise, it'll be night and day. And the a couple of story, things. What's that? The clear story is going to re remain, right? Clear stories are going to remain. So one of the things, one of the challenges with the clear stories are um, from a seismic standpoint, uh, if the if we have a, a pretty bad earthquake, all those panes of glass are just going to pop out, or they could pop out, I should say. So we're trying to figure a way, and this will happen not in schematic, but the next level, of how we can keep that just perfectly clear. You'll notice there's no mullions in it, right? It's, it's just spectacular. So we're trying to find a way that we can maintain that look, but make it safe and also energy, you know, better energy-wise. Because um, right now they're just a, a thin uh, piece of glass, which, as you all know, doesn't do a lot to stop the cold or heat from um, going one way or the other. But um, again, back to those defining elements, that clear story window on both levels, those are defining elements for, for your library. Um, one of the things we're adding or moving, I should say, is we're moving from that mid-level over here to kind of in the back area of the library is... Um, our new toilet rooms or new restrooms for um, for people, uh, and instead of instead of just two seats, so to speak, there will be three on each, and then there'll be also some downstairs. The children's area, which is located kind of in this zone, will have its own family restroom, kind of like it's used now, but this will be spe specifically for um, for children and and their parents, and then the staff will have their own restroom so that they can. Kind of be well, there's this thing we call on stage and off stage so they can be off stage take a break do what they need to do without necessarily being uh, constant we're adding an elevator uh, that will open from the ground floor to the upper floor and also the mid-level and in the space in you're in now is going to become the maker space and fab labs and we're adding windows or a big sliding doors here to an outdoor outdoor deck which people would be able to bring what they're doing out to um, out in that beautiful air one of the comments we got is this um podocarpus tree that's there uh, it's really a nice tree it's it's good health so we've devised a way that we won't harm it and so they will actually have a raised deck with a hole cut in it so you'll have to be able to go up to this tree still and sit under the tree and it's nice south facing. I wouldn't doubt that some people might take a book out there to read as opposed or in addition to um, the uses for the maker space and such. Um, in addition to the staff spaces, we've got some um, storage and um, uh, 
IT closets and electrical closets, you know, stuff that make a building work. Moving downstairs, so the stairway that you see right now, that stays in place. The landing that's there now, that stays in place. And entrance to this, your the space you're now all stays in place. What's different, and the CMU wall or the masonry wall that is there is going to be there, but on the other side of like facing kind of where the toilet room doors are now, that's where the uh, the new elevator will be. Um, and one of the things that we wanted to make sure, and I'll show you this from the ground floor, is that people coming into the space via elevator versus stairs, they have the same kind of experience that an able-bodied person would, or a person who opts to walk up the stairs, and that they don't feel like they have to go to the back of uh, the library to go up and over, or that they really don't even lose contact with the people they walk in with. That's, that's, that's taking um, access to the level of equity where you, you, you can get the same experience that an able-bodied person would. And I'll show you how that works on the ground floor. Oh, ground floor is above, sorry. Which makes no sense if you think about it. So lower level plan, as you know, the, the parking lot is here. Um, the main entrance now will be here and actually in the parking lot, you know, we'll have a little drop off lane so that, you know, you're not, you can be dropped off and, and walk straight in. So that black line right there, that's that existing wall. So we're, we're gonna maintain that wall, probably gonna put signage on it and you'll see that in a moment. But the, uh, the best, or the thing to uh, realize is that when you walk into the lo uh, lobby or on the ground floor, it's a two story space. So you're not walking into what is the ground floor now, because if you've walked in there now, you know, it's kind of bunker like, right? It's low ceiling and concrete. And you, you, you walk in there and you're kind of like, I'm in the wrong place. Don't even, um, uh, it will be nothing like that. Um, in fact, you can see here, all of this space here, and this is the edge that's open to the ground floor. And we did that for a couple of reasons, actually more than a couple. One is absolute wayfinding. You know, you step in that door, you'll look up and you'll see the library. You'll remember, oh yeah, that's the main floor. So you know where to go. The second thing is the librarians and staff that are working on the second floor can hear what's going on and see to some level very quickly what's going on downstairs. So you have an opportunity to see if something or here, do I need to get down there and see those things? But the ground floor is more about community and self-service than it is about library services. So that um, the three main types of spaces um, or four, I should say, are the community room, which you see all the way here to the left. And that community room will have a kitchen in it, a good sized kitchen that more than just a, a heating. Uh, maybe we could even have something as much as um, uh, life skills lessons or gourmet type cooking. Storage room, because there's never ever enough storage. And then um, different, uh, you know, we have an entrance here and then from the inside entrance here. Then we have a medium size meeting room and here we've shown two tables, but it could be, uh, it could be set up like a small classroom. You could have 20 people in there easily. Toilet rooms because everybody needs to go to the bathroom sooner or later. Um, but in addition, we've got a large um, custodial closet and storage room, and then another family restroom. And right now we're looking at developing that family restroom into both family restroom space and what they call a lactation room. So that if you have any nursing mothers, both staff and public, they have a place to go and do what they need to do. Uh, the passport office, the very important and uh, very appreciated passport office has a home now so that when I walk in, I don't have to hunt and search when I'm looking for, for it from when I park, I walk in the front door, there it is. The Friends of the Library retail space and then the drop-in office. And the drop-in office is still being developed from its functions, but where we're heading with that is it's a place where you can meet. I mean, and I think about... Um, I think about our, our my like my world in the last two and a half three years, and how different I work now. I mean, I'm presenting to you guys from 140 miles away, and that and um, the reality is you, you get to look at a plant. Now, if I wanted to have a bit more of a professional 
background or if my family wasn't so forgiving and allowing me to present here, thanks, Anne, um, <laughs> then I might come to the Alta Dana Library and reserve one of these spaces for my Zoom meeting. Or maybe it's a team meeting. You know, I mean, um, you know, Anderson Brule Architects, we have an office in, in San Jose, and then we have about six people that work in Southern California. So maybe I reserve it for a few hours so that I can have a team meeting in a professional setting as opposed to my kitchen table. I mean, it's a really grand opportunity for startups, for, for, for anybody and everybody who sometimes needs to have a meeting or needs to meet with people and not at a Starbucks. And so that's what this kind of space is. But likewise, you know, it'll have a couple meeting rooms behind it that augment those meeting needs for the library, both staff and users. So it can be sometimes it's check-in, drop-in, and other times it's a scheduled team meeting or it's a, it's a board meeting for the board of trustees. So it's really um, a lot of flexibility. So those are the plans, that's what's going on. And, and you know, the ground floor is still, um, it's, it's got a lot of challenges because it's concrete and very low, but I think the kinds of functions we have there have their fit well and your first impression is going to be something pretty pretty special and I'll start I'll start talking about that in your first impression so this here is the view from the parking lot and you can see that this is the two-story uh, lobby uh, that we're creating so what's what's super important is as I park my car I can see what's going on upstairs I know that I'm gonna be entering a two-story space and that there's activities upstairs that I may need to go. Again, it's, it's a way of um, wayfinding that you allow your users to anticipate where they're gonna go. Don't, you know, I always believe, and I'm, I'm not that I'm perfect at this, but if you're relying on signage to tell people where to go, you have failed in your architecture. <laughs> so what I wanna make sure is that when people enter the site, they know, oh, here's the front door. And you can see that along that elevation, you know, we've got the international symbol for welcome, which is step out of the rain. But at night or even during the day, you're gonna be able to see a lot of activity. It's, it's really not, it would be real easy to know, oh, I'm going here. Plus we'll have the sign that says Altadena. Okay, sign it. I told you I didn't. But, so, um, but more as important, if you recall to the floor plan, when you step into that library, uh, if you step right here, check it out. Passport, friends of the library, drop in, stairs up. And remember, I already knew that there was more up there and the elevator. You can even see into the maker space. So, um, you, we won't probably need a lot of signage, but again, it's it's more it's more than just wayfinding. It's about stress relief. It's about feeling welcome. You know, when you understand where you're going, when you feel comfortable stepping into a space you've never been into, you're bound to have a good experience. And that's really what we we try to uh, make sure that people have good library experiences. Um, one of the things that we wanted to make sure, though, is that the community room has a completely different entrance at times, but still shares the spaces than the main library, and that there's a gap between them. And actually this wonderful Monterey Pine does a great job you know, separating them. So that, that the community um, room, again, it's the same building, it's the same architecture and stuff, but it can function on its own in a lot of ways. Um, we really want it to be part of the community and not just a, something the library gives up, right? It's, it, it is going to be that space. And like the library, it's transparent. At night, it'll light up bright and, it, and it's easily accessed. Uh, you don't have to go into one space to find the next space. Um, this is kind of a view from the corner of the parking lot. So again, here's the entrance. Uh, we do want to kind of, keep the plaza for the community room at bay. So, you know, from here you wouldn't see it, but you would know it's there. Um, this is the current community room. So this is starting to give you an idea of some of the windows we're putting in here. And actually this is not 
drawn correctly. This is actually a lower wall. So you'll actually be able to see a little bit more in there. Um, but we'll also have direct access to that patio back there. It will be gated to make sure that people just don't come up into these hidden spots. Um, there's always a balance of access and, and this feeling of open with both safety, security, and planning for um, the homeless or the house, unhoused population. Um, and finally, um, and this is probably where we'll, we'll talk a bit more about the tricks of adding on to a historically significant building. Um, as, as I mentioned, we can honor the existing architecture, but it's, it's literally not in the interest or best interest of historic resource to just copy it. And, and John with the Historic Resources Group, he's an architect and he's really got a good eye. And at times he, he, he does, he is forceful. I mean, we hired him to be forceful. And so he's pushing us to make sure that we don't get into trouble that way. So a number of things is our additions use the same architectural language as the existing library but a different dialect, if that makes sense. So you can imagine it's gonna be a modern building. And I mean, modern uh, capital M as in 55 year old kind of architectural style. Um, but instead of using the exact masonry uh, or and we're gonna use masonry. I mean, that's another big piece because that's a huge part about your building, but we're going to use a slightly different masonry and now, what we're pushing for is one that when you squint, you don't really see a difference. John is telling us that's not enough. So we're looking at textures, colors, and even um, what we call the, um, the bonding. So your library is a very typical, you know, stack bond, running bond, they call it. Um, what we're thinking of using is either a vertical or horizontal stack bond and maybe how we, you know, just these subtle things that tell people this is a different building though it really feels like the same. Mm -hmm. um, and these are real challenges and they're really subtle and we don't wanna get into the trouble of being, you know, of, of, of not, of this building not being able to be put on the historic resources. Um, this is a view maybe at night you might see. So again, you know, you're coming into the library, especially in the winter time at four o'clock. You know, this is the view you might have, real cleared and understanding of how to get there and, and what is as the entrance. Um, again, the entrance during the day. Um, and what's neat about this is if you think about it, this wall is existing and these walls are existing, but then you'll see this this one wall over here and maybe through the glass, the one wall over here that might be slightly different. These cantilevers are very much in the style of your existing library, but we're gonna do them thinner um, and maybe with a smoother plaster, or, or, but the, then maybe they could be the same color. So again, they're, they're that same language, but a different dialect. Um, one of the other things, and I'll just, probably wrap it up here. Well, let me, there's always another thing, right? This is kind of the view we're thinking from the north end of the library. So right now, you know, you have windows here. So you can imagine on a nice day like today, well, at least it's nice up here, open these up and suddenly your, your library expands into the landscape and it would have passive seating and we can have active seating and we can do anything we'd like. Um, and as a last word, um, we wanna make sure, and this is just where we are now with the design, that when you're in the library, you're comfortable. You know, ABA, Anderson Berlay Architects, pride ourselves on designing around the, the human condition of the person. How does this person function in the space? How do they feel in the space? And how do they relate to the space? And so we're very cognizant and we're always very careful about glare, the temperature, service points, all those things. And when we say the people, we mean everyone from users to the staff, you know, they're, they're important too, because unhappy staff you rarely give you happy service, right? So um, so in a nutshell, that's, that's where we are. We're very excited. Um, we've gotten a lot of thumbs up. 
Um, we have addressed a number of changes that came out of requests and comments from both the, obviously the facilities committee, but also, and I've loved this committee, the um, community focus group, because they're hitting all, all cylinders, everything from, hey, I wanna save that podocarpus to challenging us on our, on where we are with that dialect on the language of architecture, all the way to, of course, cost. So those things are always very, very important. Um, Nikki and, or, or um, Katie or Jason, I don't know if you have anything to add or want me to point out something that I may have missed. Not that I can think of. No, I think, let's open it up for questions. I'm sure folks have some Things I'd like to know. You want me to Okay. Jason will scribe. All right. I saw your hand first in the back. Okay. Uh, what's the budget for this? Uh, Jennifer, do you want to? <laughs> yeah, I was going to let Jennifer talk about that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, our overall construction budget for both the library projects is about $20 million. Of which about 17.2 in the standard report. Is that hard in fund cost? That's construction. Yeah, it's construction cost. Yeah. Yes. And the budget is 172 for the main library, and the difference between 17.2 and 20 million. 2.8 to 20 million. That's right. And you have that in your budget? We do. Yeah. Oh. Thanks to all the books. And, and the, the 40 million people in California because of the nice grant that yeah, this library district wrote oh, and received. Yeah, there was a infrastructure grant put out by the California State Library and we applied for 9 million and we got 7.5. The will wow. have to match That's dollar nice. for dollar. But that just, uh, when we did cost estimates when I first got here in the beginning of 2020, um, fast forward to hiring Anderson Brulee, about a year ago, we were off by like five million because of the difference in cost just in those few years in construction and everything else that's happened. So thankfully, we have this buffer to make up the difference to make sure we can do the projects the way that the community really wants. So yeah, we're in really good shape, thankfully. I wasn't sure from the diagram, and maybe I just can't see it. Where are the facilities for the friends? Oh, okay. Mark, do you want to go just back to that? I didn't catch the question, Nikki. Can you repeat it? Can you zoom in on the, the friend space, both the retail and the storage, just to show people where that is? And Yeah. So there's about a 400 square foot storage and sorting room and about a 350 square foot um, retail space. And, you know, if you decide you need less retail and more storage, we can, you know, pull walls in or out. But um, this this felt about right and worked well. Yeah. What is what was the reason for moving the uh, friends bookstore from where it's on the main level to the lower level? So there there are a couple of reasons. I think one is that because we're reimagining how people are entering this space, this is the first thing. It's like directly in the straight eye line of when you walk in that new reimagined van. So the very first thing you see is the friend retail space. The second thing that we wanted to address was just a, a lack of retail space on the floor we're on now. And so by moving it downstairs, we were able to effectively double the retail space that would be available for the friends. One of the things we've heard over and over again is, you know, gosh, stuff really stocks up and it's difficult to store all of it and store all of it, which is so true. So by having more active retail space on that ground floor, hopefully, you know, that's, yeah, it won't be it won't be such pressure on storage. Um, it also allows for after hours access. Yep, that's right. Sure. Oh, so I'm I'm just going to uh, on behalf of the friends of the Athena Library, and so Marlene being one. But you, you know, we had a great meeting, Mark. Just so you know, and my name's Mark. But we had a great meeting with um, Nikki and with Jason and Katie a week ago, I think it was, right, on yeah. a Zoom call, and laid out a lot of the concerns 
And mind you, the, the Friends of the Alchemy Library since 1959 has been doing a lot of lot of things here. And I've been fortunate to be part of the foundation, the Friends, and the Trustees in my 30 years up in this area. But but I will say that there's going to be a letter coming still, laying out some additional concerns because one of the things after we finished the discussion had to do with some additional discussions going forward. And so where Mark just said, you know, that if, if the retail space needs to adjust smaller to let the storage be bigger or something on the combined. You know, let's say it's 750 square feet combined. Um, you know, we're going to continue to have that discussion. I will say that the friends have said, though, to the trustees and to the staff that they, they still think they need a little bit more space. And so there's going to be some ongoing discussions about that. But I think the idea of, um, you know, being upstairs would be nice, but also understanding downstairs. And, and mind you, I'm not speaking for the entire board right now, but I will tell you that. Um, it, the, the, the people that were on that call, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, did enjoy what Mark just said with the idea that if on a, on a Saturday afternoon or evening and the library is closed to the public, but yet there's going to be a nice big, you, you know, Phoebe's going to do a concert in there and, and we're going to have 150 people here, that the friends then could actually open up the bookstore as part of the extension of people coming in to use the restrooms and stuff. So I think there's there's some good synergy still, but there's going to be some more discussion. So I don't want anybody to think that um, you, you know that that everybody is at a hundred percent happy with everything. But the idea that we can continue to discuss while we're still in schematic design before we get to construction documents, because when you get to construction documents, it's very difficult to make changes. And so I think this is a, a good time to do it. But you know the friends do believe that. Most of the people, the people in here, I hope you come and bought books before and you want to continue to buy books. And the library trustees have made it apparent that they want to have a book sale here so that people are not throwing books in the trash, you know, throwing them and doing whatever, but, you know, that we can use them, get the recycled books here, get them out to the PUSD for the immersion programs of French and Spanish, that kind of stuff. So anyway, I just wanted to share that thought and kind of follow up with that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Pam on the chat had asked where the bookshelves are. So that's a very good question, Pam. We are currently looking at the specific out layouts for each of the spaces, the children's, the teens, the adult, and working with the library staff to determine where the new collection, uh, both how it's accessed, where it's accessed, and the, the specific numbers. Um, there's just some great opportunities uh, right now to look at those spaces a little bit differently than just kind of lumping them always over to the side or off to the back where they are now. So uh, ultimately you will see the locations of those. Is the intention to retain the size of the collection? How is the overall size of our book collection going to be affected by how the spaces are reimagined? Um, we're looking at 100%. And then like going from there to see like how much space we're going to give to stacks versus more open space. I mean, obviously when you're putting in three more or two additional meeting rooms, like something's got to give, but we, we are looking at different versions of it at hundred percent, 80 percent, you know, overall with the way we've moved, like we're potentially going to move children and teens. I don't think their collections will be reduced at all it may be that adult collection would have to be cut back a little bit, but it just depends on like what we decide and what we hear in these meetings. And I'll just add to that. Um, we're also looking at how the collections and circulation are changing, right? So especially over the course of the pandemic, the way people are using the collections has changed. We reallocate our budget every six months, it seems like, to deal with that. And we're, you know, integrating our mobile library units and potentially even some, some library vending machines, which is very cool. So our collections are also going to be out and about more. And so they won't just be in this building. Um, and I think that's an important part of this as well. Mm -hmm. this is a very good point. Kind of circulating through the community. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Amy um, online had asked about, uh, um, is the new glass paneling going to be designed to minimize bird strikes? And um, this is a, this is just a heartbreaking thing because we've come to realize that with the exception of cats, I think architects are worth are responsible for more bird deaths than um, <laughs> but um, and I live in a glass house and there isn't a day goes by that we we don't hear the thunk. 
Um, but it's a real challenge and it's a real problem. And so that's where some of these items, like on the south side, they serve dual purpose. Not only are they cutting down glare and energy use and also uh, creating a sh shadow, but they also stop the birds from trying to fly through the library. On the north side, it's going to be a challenge because by definition, we want those to be open. We need to keep that view. One of the uh, biggest kudos we got from our historic uh, architect was the fact that as you drive across Mariposa or down Santa Rosa, you really won't see any differences in the library as you see now. So in order to address those, um, the glazing on those windows, um, uh, we would have to change the nature of them. And even then, because even when you put a frit on them and stuff to, to help birds, they they see something that looks like sky and they, they head towards it. So I'm, the answer is, I'm sorry. I, there's not a lot we can do, but we will where we can. I feel bad. So um, I wanted to ask um, about the community room. Uh, so I, I noticed that the community room is basically just a glazed entrance. Uh, there's a whole glazing all across the front of it. As I, as I, as I read it, uh, and downstairs, right? So, um, that you just you go right straight into the community room. There's no uh, transitional space, and um, that's okay. I, I don't believe it. I wonder about storage and AV um, uh, stuff like that. Like, how is that going to work in there? Um, which or we have all the seats oriented towards the back wall. It has has windows in it. Is, is that going to be that? So greening. Uh... Yeah, that's um, so. You're right about what you're seeing. There, there's a it's a glass wall along here, so there is no ante room or or uh, vestibule. You know, there there is. You can enter the the community room this way. So you know, maybe if it's not a big blowout type thing, or you, you do want it, there will be a set of doors as well as the movable walls, um, so that you would have a choice um, going back and forth. Um, and that's just. That's just one of space, right? You know, every every square foot we build costs money, and we want to be judicious with our our uh, resources. Um, these windows are we are looking at the AV wall being here at this point, um, and we haven't developed it a hundred percent yet. We're working with our, our AV consultant is working with David, or will be working with David to see how we want to do that, and that may. Uh, change the nature of the glazing on that uh, wall, um, but even if it's a you know if it's a drop down screen, we we can we can leave it there. If it's mounted televisions or uh, monitors, that's a different animal. So we may have to adapt that. Uh, so uh, as far as storage goes, or I see there are a number of rooms in the back there. So is there any place to to put you know equipment and sound equipment and? Yeah, that's space number four is storage. Okay. Good. Yeah, uh, space number two is a new electrical room. So. Yeah, I, I want to also ask you about um, who the, what's the name of the uh, historic consultant and who is the landscape architect? So the the name of the company is um, Historic Resources Group (HRG) and they're in Pasadena. John uh, Lascazo is our consultant. Again, he's an Altadena resident. So that's, you know, he he had to win this, right? It was wonderful. Um, our um, landscape architect is a gentleman named uh, Ben uh, McCoy. And the name of his uh, firm is, um, um, his firm name sounds more like an architecture uh, firm. Um, he lives up the street from me, so I know him as Ben. Um, what What is it? It's um, Department of Space. That's right, Department of Space. Doesn't that sound more like an architecture firm than a did that? <laughs> and Ben, um, what's kind of neat, this is a little poetic, is Ben worked for the firm that did the original landscape um, design on the uh, campus or on the um, site 55 years ago. EPT? Yeah. Yeah, EPT, right. Yeah. And so he worked there for like 15 or 16 years and struck out on his own. And, um, yeah. The same space. Are we looking at a two-story space, or is it, is it the community more? room? Yeah. 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 So the community that? room is is uh, it's about I think about fifteen feet tall, anywhere between twelve and fifteen. We haven't 
figure that out quite yet what we need for our mechanical. From the outside, it looks like there's a patio So that's a, um, you know, that's a, so it's, it's, this is really one big space behind there. And this is outside only to help as you approach the building, not feeling, you know, ah, I'm being towered over as well mm -hmm. as for stun control. Um, we're looking at opportunities that maybe this is instead of a solid roof, a set of like a trellis or something. And it's to help kind of break down the scale and, and um, feel, feel better in it. So the storage rooms would be 15 feet tall as well. Um, no, if you, um, you know, we started that way, um, but then we realized we had all the space above. So above those three spaces behind, we're taking an opportunity to create storage room for the library side, the IT room, and what is a custodial closet for upstairs. Second question, uh, mm -hmm. on the Lavacosa side, it looks as though there's a wall built where the amphitheater is. Yeah, they have uh, up the front here on the street. Yeah, that would be a retaining wall. There's about four and a half feet fall from Mariposa to the your library sits really low. So what you would see again, this is again, this this worked really well for us. You would only see the top of a wall, maybe the first foot, and then it would look like what you have now. Um, so all this, all of what you see here, and uh, I'll be frank with you, this is developing still. Um, everything you see here will you won't you won't really see as you drive by, or even eh, you'll probably see when you walk by because you're moving slow enough. It'll be seven thousand floor level. What was that? I was, I was just filling in some details, Mark. Oh, and we are adding up front here, um, kind of a signage wall that will hark back to the wall that exists here. So that you kind of have these bookends. Remember when I mentioned something about um, the um, your building being a series of these kind of walls that are in the landscape and the building? So we'll be adding one out here to kind of bookend them and give that symbol of entry, entry wall, entry wall, wall with signage. So, Scott, yeah, yeah. Um, you presented some really, I think, really great innovative ideas, but I, I do have a, a question that, that I'd like you to clarify. I used to own a, a Victorian in, in the Echo Park section of LA and Angelina Heights. You're probably familiar with that area. Sure. And there were lots of Victorians there that people had tried to remodel and, and modernize, modernize, and you know, they'd stucco over the great Victorian shingles and such. This is mostly in the 50s and 60s. And I subscribed to a magazine called the Old Housing Journal, sure. which tried to educate homeowners on how to restore homes in the style of that home instead of trying to make it something else. So you stated as a truism that you you don't want to copy the the architecture of the existing building. And and could you clarify, well, I'm not quite sure why that is, why that's a bugaboo, other than to show your mark on what you've done with the new. No, absolutely the opposite. Um, if it were if it were up to me, it would be invisible. I, I own a historically significant home where my wife and I did an addition and you can't tell. It's the desire for this to be considered a historic resource. And when here's the thinking, and, and I, I and I do subscribe to this thinking. I'm not arguing with the Secretary of State. I would never win. But um, <laughs> what they determine, and and we I'll be happy to share some examples with you. I, I don't have them at hand, but I can find them and get them to you. But the thinking is it's a historic resource, and we want to honor and keep intact as much of that as possible. But they also understand that buildings have long lives and over that lives, everything changes from technology to uses. So what they decided, and this is this is from, oh my gosh, the early seventies, I think this was written into a policy, maybe the eighties, is that you can make changes to historic building. You can do whatever you want to a historic building. 
but what you do has to stand out from it. It has to be clear that that is not original. So you can kind of picture, and I'm gonna be a little farcical here, is that um, let's say um, you have a pyramid, it's, a, it's your tomb, and you know your great grandchild has decided that in in that tomb that they want a new kitchen, a modern, or they want to upgrade the kitchen. So they they do this kitchen that looks exactly like the kitchen that would have been the original pyramid, right? Like, oh man, King Tut would love this kitchen. And then it gets buried in sand and dug up two thousand years later, five thousand years later, and the archaeologists are looking at it, going, you know. I can't believe that they had these kitchens when King Tut was alive, but there it is. It looks just like the rest of it, built exactly the same way. Now that's you know an extreme, right? And then purposely so. The idea is that when when this building is used as a historic resource, people will understand. Oh, this is not original, and it's important that they know it's not original because. They, you don't want to mislead them of what was happening in 1968. You don't want to mislead them, mislead them, mid, mislead them on how people lived, use spaces, how we built, the materials we use, all those things. And in fact, um, we are ha we have to show reason why we're changing it. And that's that's the other piece about this. You know, we don't get to come in and just say we want a new ceiling. Um, we have to replace that ceiling because we have to access the whole structure in order to upgrade it seismically. And it's a ceiling that that particular ceiling you can't tear down and put up. And so the minute you have to take it down, according to this, this rule or this, the, the way that uh, they look at it, they don't want you to put it back looking like the old ceiling. They, they want it to be different. So, clear that it's not original yeah so again i i don't i know i know a lot of people disagree with that i i can't argue um otherwise but this is the standards um that currently we're working towards because we want to make sure that this building maintains its uh ability to be a historic resource i, I think the stucco and the the smooth stucco with the thin lines starts to approach looking like a Chick-fil-A. Yeah, absolutely. And I just use as an example, I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't want to use a smooth stucco on this building because I think it would be. So you're getting um, special permission to do that with some permit. Well, what, what it is, it's, a, it's an interesting conversation with, with our historic resource architect. Um, and it's in some ways it's a, it's a, a trade, right? You know, He's been so appreciative of how sensitive we've been that what we're doing, he feels very comfortable with being able to sell to the Secretary of the Interior. Um, others might look at what we're doing and saying, you're destroying that entire South Elevation. How dare you, right? So, but when they hear that the reason we're doing it is for access compliance, it, ADA access has to be met. And really the only way to do that is by creating an entrance, not at the middle level, but bottom level. But then you start thinking about what that would mean architecturally and what, you know, uh, for the people and equity issues, you know, you if you were to relegate it just to meet the code, you would be telling people who needed ADA entrances, here's the back door for you. Well, that's also not allowed and not real friendly. So we're we're embracing the American Disabilities Act and saying not only, you know, it's it's more than just equal, it is the same. And that really is one of those tenets of the ADA that we try to that that that's part of it. So there, it's it's a real gray area. And I would like, I mean, I would love to, I mean, we could probably talk about this for the rest of the day, but um can I say something real quick, please? Because I don't know what I mean. Can you see us? Uh, I can only see a portion of you. Okay. Um, I, I really love the presentation. Really good. I came here thinking that there was going to be no, no respect to the historical nature of the building. And you hit all the points. Like, as a presentation, you could package that and show it to your students. 
But I think I'm just challenging you to think a little bit beyond the stucco Chick fil A look, since you're still in the works, and what materials specifically can enhance instead of look like a Starbucks or what other example the box stucco looks like. So that's all. But and the other thing that concerned me is you want people to walk into this space and just know where to go and you don't want any signage at all. I love that philosophically, but people want to know where to go. Oh the no, we to figure out how to put signs up in places. So you should be really embracing signage like uh Lear absolutely no no my my point being is if you depend on signage you've not done a good job we oh. will have signage here we're not barbarians that was a joke <laughs> um no we we definitely will have signage everything from and we're required to have signage just for rooms so yeah it wasn't a disparaging remark about signage it was a disparaging remark about architects who don't care about what people see when they walk in and understand that stress. Are there any plans for solar, uh, battery backup, rainwater treatment for the uh, garden sites? So um, a couple things, and, and I need to do a little bit of research into this. Um, the code just changed where you're required now to have both solar and battery. I don't think that applies to this project except for maybe the additions. So we'll look into that. Um, I don't think currently those, the two, solar and battery, are in the budget. So we'll need to revisit that if that's the desire. Let me just say um, a couple of things on that, Mark. So one of the things that we've looked at in the current budget is what makes sense to spend bond money on versus what might be available with grant money later on. So the rehab program, as well as I believe Bob Whitfield, if I'm remembering correctly, both of those groups are going to be solar ready so that we can put oh, solar when it makes sense, you know, and we can kind of get the best, the best deal possible. Um, so we will have everything we need to infrastructure wise, but we're not including the solar panels in this particular zone. Just because we think we're going to be able in five, six years to get probably a better deal than we can get three hundred years. Yeah, actually, Janet had asked the question also in regards to whether there would be any gas powered utilities. Um, we haven't gotten that far, but our first point would be no, we would use heat pumps in lieu of gas fired furnaces. And beyond that, there would be no need for gas. Um, they also, Janet also asked about the federal ADA versus the California ADA. Um, we will be following the California ADA. That's what our, the jurisdiction we answer to, um, as well as I believe the California ADA has some aspects to it that are a little bit stricter than the federal, but I could be wrong there. Um, also a little back, I think some gray water was mentioned. Yeah. Um, you know, unfortunately, Altadena doesn't have available to it purple pipe that is recycled water that we could use for irrigation as well as for flushing toilets. So the answer for that is no. Although for irrigation, it will be a separate meter. So when that does become available, um, it'll be an easy, easy fix. Um, as far as gray water goes, uh, if you can believe this in this day and age, it's still illegal to use gray water in the County of Los Angeles. Um, and we're all gray. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, point driven, someone might complain. But I would I would encourage everyone in this room to complain to Supervisor Barber that we are oh. woefully behind on gray water capture, period. Yeah. So um, you know, I, I again when I like I'm doing I my rebuilding my studio at home because of a big wind, but you know, we're looking at a gray water system too. And I will tell you, and, and I'm a homeowner, right? So I can control who uses what shampoo in that shower. It's <laughs> terrifying. But um, you know, it's something that I'm a big believer in. Uh, we are uh, held to um, at what they call LID uh, standards for water water quality and water retention. And fortunately, your site has so much green space that those won't be they'll be not only not difficult to meet, um, we'll be able to exceed those requirements. So. Um, 
I wanted to speak up just a moment for the books. I think it might not have so much to do with the architecture, but um, the fact that we're getting a lot more space and we're getting fewer books, that does uh, disturb me a little bit. And I noticed even when we come in to buy uh, or to get things to listen to when we're going on a trip, that the kind of the range of what's available now is less than it used to be. And there's fewer, like even kind of classic things here that it's more like just what, you know, the most popular thing. And, and when uh, 20 years ago, when I researched the Altadena book, we had a wonderful case even of rare materials that was then given to the historical society that then got rid of a lot of it. So that resource was lost. And when I think of LACMA, you might have heard what they're doing there is that they've made much more space um, and yet there's less exhibition space for the art. Here it is an art museum. And I just hope that we don't go too overboard, you know, making it all sorts of things extra and that we and that we lose books. I think that would be a shame. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, hi, I'm um I run the Mount Lord Chamber Players uh, Chamber Music Group, and the library has generously sponsored our concerts here since 2020. Uh, we normally perform in the main library in the northwest corner. We move some furniture, we set up chairs, uh, and the musicians generally play on the carpet, although tomorrow we're going to try a dance floor. Um, we've never played in the sunken area because there's sightline issues. So I have questions about the new community room. Um, 15 feet ceiling is a little low for performance space, uh, but more concerning is what's the surface of the floor gonna be? Um, are the chairs uh, stationary? Or are they movable chairs that can be set up? And various acoustical concerns about what that room's gonna look like. Totally can understand your concerns. Um, so, you know, it is a community room, basically a multi-purpose room more than any sort of specific type of performance space. And yes, you know, 24 feet is the magic number for uh, uh, for acoustics and uh, for music, 23, 24 feet. And we just, we just don't have that kind of volume available to us, both architecturally and money-wise. Um, so, you know, it's, it's the type of space that is going to serve a lot of different masters and some of them better than others. It has to remain flexible. So all the seating that you see, saw on the floor plan there, that's just going to be chairs that are stackable and uh, be able to put away. So you could have a dance in there or you could uh, have a banquet or something like that. Um, Acoustics are going to be important, but not from a music standpoint, more from just making sure it's not an echoey space, that it's serviceable for the types of functions that, um, well, like you're using today. So it still may not be that wonderful performance space that you would be looking for. Um, I will guarantee you it would be better than the space you're in now. Um, but I don't know if that's saying a whole lot. I, how many people could be seated there? And what's the surface of the floor gonna be like? So the surface, because again, it needs to have a certain level of utility will be a hard surface, whether it's rubber, whether it's VCT or even a polished concrete that has yet to be decided. Um, you asked how many people could be seated there. So if it's, we figured there's at least 200 in chairs, like you see them laid out there, at least I bet you we could get a lot more than that. I forget the number that's shown here, but I don't want to give you a bigger number if it's not that. Um, and if it's dining, you know, like for a banquet and such, you'd probably be looking at about half that, maybe a hundred people. So it could support quite a few different functions. And it's all on the same level. There's no stage or incline or- No stage. Yeah, if we, you know, stages are wonderful things, but they're, um, they take away usable space from other, you know, that flexibility. And for ADA access, then you have to have either a lift or a ramp. So what we would recommend that if you did want some sort of stage, it would be a, uh, a portable platform, you know, the type, the risers that you can, you know, well, you're a choral group, you're very familiar with those. So it would be that kind oh, of. Uh, instrumental. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. 
Uh, the flat floor is is great for us. Uh, our concerts tend to be kind of intimate and more a pensive experience than a you know raucous dance experience. So I'll tell you that you know I hope that you guys decide not to pull it from the main floor because I think there's an intimacy and a specialness of, of performing there that you know if it's a community room it's like oh I'm going to a concert but if it's in the library it's it's a community event. Yeah, I do think we hope to keep the main floor as flexible as possible as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. cool. I I don't have a question. I just wanted to say I'm really loving some of these ideas of making the library more accessible from the parking lot. It's always felt very. I, I know there are access points, but it hasn't felt very accessible. Um, it hasn't felt like it draws me in. And the way this is being designed right now, and I'm there have been plenty of questions about the utilization of certain spaces, but the way it's being designed right now, I feel it's very inviting where it hasn't been inviting from the parking lot. So I just wanted to add that in. And I'm very pleased to see I'm not going to nitpick over all the spaces. I know there's plenty of people doing that, but I'm really excited to see a very different way of entering the, the library from the parking lot. I appreciate that. And the first uh, Mount Low Chamber concert was almost exactly three years ago. I think it was three years ago this weekend, right before the pandemic, yep. we had the postponed second two. And we had a reception in this room following the concert. Were you here, Bridget? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We set up 60 chairs upstairs and we had 160 people come. So we were scrambling to grab enough seats for everybody. It was so successful um, upstairs, obviously. And then at the end of the concert, um, a woman was walking her father over the reception and we reached the top of the stairs. He had a walker and he couldn't go to the reception. And it was like, I'd been in this position about three months at the time. And it was like such a clear demonstration why we need to do this work. Right. So thank you for saying yeah. that and tied nicely into BB. Yeah, but... and this current space is, feels like a dungeon every time. <laughs> <I think. laughs> yep. It'll be wonderful to have a light, airy space to come together in. And wonderful that you're also trying to allow space for us to go out into the grounds because the grounds here are beautiful. Um, and to be able to move from within the library out into the landscape is also just going to be wonderful. You have expressed <laughs> everything that I have felt about the library over the years and about it, it's an excellent presentation. It's clear you've spent a lot of good time thinking about how to make spaces work well for what we're doing now. And I really, whatever you can do to make the Mount Low Chamber area presentation <laughs> improved i absolutely support that and i'll be here tomorrow <laughs> so yeah i i think this is just magnificent i love the indoor outdoor access points and and the flexibility of using them in different ways i it's just it's a wonderful thing what time is the concert tomorrow please? three the concert is free and it's free and it's pretty and breathtaking. Yes. Yes. Um, I wanted to echo what you said about the um, amount of work that's gone into this and the amount of attention to detail. And you can tell that there were many voices that have um, contributed. Um, to echo my original comment about the collection space, you know, I come from a family of people who work in libraries and have loved libraries, and I love actual books. Mm -hmm. That having been said, um, I have been encouraged over many months of hearing you talk about the blog and about <laughs> library, of finally downloading them and using both. And there's value to that service as well. So I do get that how library spaces are utilized is changing. But at the very core, they are about the books. And so making sure that adults have access to good books and classic books and rare books, all of it is a balancing act. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sure that those who are in the know of those things and are doing the research on those things will take care. My question was around access from Santa Rosa. So when 
the library parking lot is overflowing, and it's often the case that it is. You have to park along Santa Rosa. And if you park north of the parking lot entrance, there is no easy way. And I've watched mothers struggle with young children, anyone that's got a stroller. Is there any way, when we've got culverts there, I get it, but to create some sort of access so you're not having to walk up or down Santa Rosa to get to a place to access an access point. Mm -hmm. It's a great question, Victoria. Yeah. And actually, if you're going to call Barger's office, you could lobby for this. Too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, we would like to reduce Mariposa down to two lanes and have slotted parking yeah. along. Yeah. You know, so we're we're um, Rackman Partners is already. We've been in conversation with the county what almost two years now, Jennifer. And there is there was already a plan in motion. Yes, I remember. But I think if we could have parking up there on both sides, that would hopefully alleviate a need to park on Santa Rosa as much. Because I agree. Um, feedback that I've gotten from the past is that it's really hard to change anything about Christmas tree lane. You know, so even in putting like so, a, a bridge or something over a culvert that would allow you enough space. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I would really like to, well, plus, I mean, my office, which I'm going to miss it, it's a wonderful space. I watch people speeding up and down Mariposa. I don't think it needs four lanes, personally. Um, I think that will slow people down, and it will solve a big parking need that I think would help. Because as Mark said, like, if there's a clear shot in off from the east entrance and you park up there, um, I think it'll solve a lot of problems with the overflow. And just tying on to that part of uh, my work uh, with the town councils on a, a traffic safety committee, and Mariposa definitely doesn't have the need for that that kind of space, kind of a holdover from the uh, the old historic the, the old streetcar line. And uh, you know, there's so much the curbs are so huge as they are, people can't get out. So. Starting to talk to the county, and they're starting to listen to the idea. They they like multi benefit projects or something that catches the water in those mm -hmm. deep curves, mm -hmm. and then has right. the that would be pulling mm -hmm. pulling the street out of them with the curve fly out. Um, and then you know, active transportation, narrow streets, traffic calming, maybe a bike lane or what have you, with all the schools and facilities along this route. So uh, that's something. We're, uh, continue to ring out with the county. The one thing that we do know, and this complicates this effort, is we what we do know is we can't just simply restripe it, right? Because because of the way it's currently designed, we wouldn't even come close to meeting current ADA guidelines on slope if we just simply reach like there's a whole regrading that would have to happen, like right. And so then you start have to ask, okay, so who's going to pay for that? So I, I can tell you, like, we've been thinking about that from day one, but it's obviously, you know, like you just shared, right? So I think I think part of the reason why, you know, we continue to keep town council updated on what we're looking at, because they're working on that. I know that especially this is like a huge project of hers for a very long time, right? So um, hopefully we'll be able to get there. And I think it would go beyond just simply benefiting the library when we need it. But right? it seems like this is the opportune time to do it. So where is it hung up? Where is the idea of redesigning Mariposa? Where I, is it hung up? I think I've found the plans on online. The county has done it already. So um, where is it hung up? So is it, the, is it the money? Because it's a budget. No, I mean, they budget it, so it, far it, out. I don't think we're necessarily far enough along to be able to say where the hung up is. What okay. I can tell you is, is so you're not getting resistance anywhere. No, but what I would say is, you know, we're not, it's not like we're like pushing 110 percent full speed ahead just because of where we're at in this process. But it does right? sort of feel like we should be. But there will it will get to that point. Yeah, you know, gonna, I guess I'm, all I'm saying is the bang for the buck with the county is going to come. From the county being able to ride the coattails of this in providing that. Yeah. So I think it's a good think, yeah. so for them to yeah. see the benefit in doing it as in aligning with this project, yeah. we'll get it further down the road. And you've got time because you, you know we're yeah. some time out in terms of doing this. What would move it is I think if we can get to the point where we have 
where we can literally call it, genuinely call it a joint project, right? Where the town council has looked at Mariposa and said, okay, this is kind of our vision for Mariposa. We now are like, well, that perfect timing is built into what we're already thinking. Get Barger's office, because at the end of the day, where the hangup is going to be is with county plan. Mm -hmm. at, at one point, that's where it's going to be. And do we have the political support and will through Barger's office and the town council behind that to like kind of like let's speed things along, right? Um, and then obviously we'd have to work with her office on. on, on I think hearing that the library's willing and, and you know if, if you show even something conceptual without spending a lot of money, that'll be a nice signal that a huge part of this, you know, maybe the community center next door um is willing to receive that and then that way it shouldn't come out of library budget in my opinion there's a there is a lot of money a lot of money it just needs to get prioritized in such a way that there's enough community benefit enough people saying yeah this is time to remake this part of their all the way to the night market thing that's right, you know, yeah. right down the street um i know crossing guards here for any kind of event you know you've got a much longer street to cross with the mm -hmm. hump in the middle so bringing the street in will have all kinds of benefits, I think, for, for a lot of people. What is your time? What is the what's the proposed? How far out are we from from concept to where? Are we? What's the time? So I'll I'll speak to that. Jennifer, correct me if I'm wrong. So the plan was to renovate the Bob Lucas Library first, and then we'll continue to work through all of the planning for Maine. As we know, this is been, it's taking a lot longer than it did with the Bob Lucas project. Um, being that we're adding about a thousand square feet to Bob Lucas, it triggered a conditional use permit process with LA County. So we submitted everything to them back in September, it typically takes six to 12 months. So we're kind of waiting on that process to finish up, um, hire a contractor and then start the Bob Lucas project. That is estimated to take about a year. And at this point, the earliest it would start is late summer, yeah. Jennifer. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say Probably fall. Fall. Yeah, twenty twenty three for Bob Lucas. Yes. I mean, how long will that process? It's gonna. It's supposed to take about a year. So um, then we're fall twenty twenty four. Right, and that when we grand reopen Bob Lucas is when we would start the main project, and okay. that's estimated to take a year and a half to two years. Okay. So yeah, we're looking at yeah, yeah. And we started to develop just a little bit of sympathy for the people responsible for the bullet train. <laughs> Not much, but a yeah, bit. a little bit. Sorry. I just wanted to say that there have been plans, they're already there, and there were some that were done maybe 10 years ago, and some that were done even earlier. So it seems if they could be brought on board, that it wouldn't be starting from scratch oh, so. on what right. would be needed. Yeah, I think they're using those. That's my understanding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Will the library be closed? Yes. Yeah. Right now we're exploring an alternate site for the main library so that we can still obviously not in the same capacity offer services, but have a site um, for people to visit. We're also purchasing another mobile library unit, hoping to launch homebound services as well as like expanding our footprint at pop-ups and partnering with businesses throughout the community. And as Katie mentioned, I believe, yeah, um, David and I, David's my IT manager, on the way, David, um, we just did a request for proposals to purchase two library vending machines. So we're, I, I would like to buy three. It'll depend on what it costs. Identifying places um, in town where those would stay even after the renovations, but you could be checking out library materials 24 hours a day um, out of those as well. So really, we look at these projects also as an, an opportunity to expand our footprint throughout the town in places that maybe you currently don't think of the library. Uh, if we have, let's say I have a book that I specifically want and it's in this library, can I go to the Bob Lucas library and say, I want this book and they'll just yes. bring it over? Yep. Perfect. We do that multiple times a day. <laughs> Um, I just want to say I really like the whole outdoor concept having a school library. I'm the kind of person who likes to be outside. Most of the time, I love to eat outside. I love to summer. Um, so I really like that whole idea of everything being open and just being able to be outside. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I also like that little outdoor space with a cover. 
But what attracted me to Altadena is the mountains. I love to look at the mountains, to enjoy them. And I'm wondering if there's any possibility of adding like a seating space up on top, like a railing to kind of give it a sit in. Put on the roof? On the roof. On the roof. Yeah, I think that's what I want in my office. Yeah, right. Okay, so that must be part of the you about thinking about how we can position usable space, not only outdoor, but like in the adult steps, right, where we're putting them. And as you're kind of looking now through the whole library from what is basically the south end, can you see all the way northward? And yeah, that's what I want to see. I don't want to just sit right in front, right? Yeah, I want to Oh, yeah, that's a nice expansive feeling. Like, I don't think we're gonna get like it on the roof, but it doesn't feel like it. No, no, no. Well, I'm just thinking you have Wi-Fi now. Yeah, that's right. But that north side while you're at it. Yeah, that's so nice. Yeah, there we go. Seriously, I mean, I understand that. Having the book is nice. I actually like having the book, but I think the younger generations and everyone below certain age, maybe they would appreciate like the new te digital technology. And I can see why we would need to kind of reduce the collection yeah. a little bit. I mean, I think we also have to think of the future. And I think a lot of the younger generations say, you know, everything's digital for them. Well, and I, I will just say too, I mean, there has been a fear in like library world generally, right? That like books are going away. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to tell you it's never going to happen, right? The yeah. library will always have books, it will always have a robust collection. It is true, like what Michelle says is right, that collection does look different today than it did 20 years ago. And it will look different 20 years from now, right? But part of what we want is not just a facility, but, you know, a community of folks that are involved so that if there are things that you want in your collection yeah that you feel included and welcome in that process you can say hey i need this that and the other thing and that's you know we're trying to balance that and that set of requests from from as many folks as we can i think with yeah. you guys expanding on the vending machines and i guess it's still mobile um library i mean i think you have a lot more so yeah and, and I'll just say too, because like this has kind of been a recurring theme, right? Um, you know, I know we don't get like this amazing turnout for our monthly board meetings because they they are incredibly exciting. I can promise you. Um, but but one of the things we do is we get every month at the board meeting we receive as a board and review and make comments on collection numbers. Literally, we can see month to month changes even within the collection and even year over year, right? And I know, um, you know, Katie and I are just starting our second term, but even before us, we've requested and, you know, with Nikki and her team have made a lot of changes to what, what that data is exactly that we see each month, right? And so there's, we, I, I can just assure you, at least with the current board and the current library leadership, that, that is something we pay attention to and look closely to, um, and there is like some really amazing community involvement in like that kind of collection decision making. Like yeah. you were saying, yeah. like we have a teen advisory council that's involved in like, that kind of like weeding and like looking at diversity and all that kind of stuff in our collection. So there's some really, really cool stuff going on. So I, I just, I can assure everybody that that is something that, that we look at and, and do pay attention to because I agree. I mean, I've got my four books from today right here, right? Like there, it always has to be. Uh, both, right? I, I don't think it's an or yeah. question. And I met with our, we fell on our persons in charge. So kind of like our leadership group yesterday, we had training. And I think over that, we have the opportunity over the next year to two to really study how the building's being used as well. You know, like what, how many people are coming in to check out items? How many people are here to use computers and internet? How many are here for programming? Let me tell you, it's a lot. Like people love programs in Altadena like I've never seen before. But making sure that like as we're designing the spaces, it's reflective of how the building is being used, right? Um, there's also, in a way that I've never seen it integrated in libraries before, a patron 
what's it called? Initiated purchase. Yeah, HIPS for short. Um, so really like everything that's suggested as a purchase is reviewed by the collection and selector team. So we definitely want to give the community what they want. Do people get what they used to be that when you put in a selection, like within a week, you could be in the library. Mm -hmm. Is that still happening? Yeah, they look at the cost of the item and a lot of times we'll purchase it and add it to the collection rather than, well, because you can do interlibrary loan, meaning like get a book from another library system that sometimes takes two to four weeks. If we can purchase it for less than it costs to have it sent and, and return, we'll just buy it and then add it. So yeah, it's it's a very responsive um, collection process, I would say. Mm -hmm. So getting back to this whole sort of time with the design and sort of the way things change and things are evolving in order for reaching libraries, is the design such that it can be flexible. For example, we were just talking about how, you know, three years ago, we would not have needed all those rooms to uh, let people do Zoom meetings, right? Yeah. So, you know, we don't really know exactly what's going to happen in the next 10 years and how the world is going to change and how people are going to get a one use their spaces. You are so right. So Jason is writing up a concept that has been at the center of our conversations from day one, which is teacher feedback, right? So you're exactly right. We don't know what the community is going to need 45 years from now, 50 years from now. But we want to design a facility that is sufficiently flexible and adaptable that it can meet those needs. And that's exactly why you're seeing a lot of spaces that we're describing as multi-purpose or indoor-outdoor spaces for exactly that reason. You know, maybe it's shelving that is on wheels so we can reconfigure, you know, our spaces really easily. It's having more for electrical access points and Wi-Fi everywhere, you know, that you could absolutely find it. Um, so that's exactly the concept that has been driving our approach is, you know, I'd say kind of the two, the two big things are universal design. Is this a building that welcomes absolutely everybody in the community? And future proofing. Is this a design that is going to stand at the time and be usable 50, 60, 70 years from now? So yes, that's, that's a huge, huge concern. Could I just, uh, I'm sorry, I, I have to say, I really think it's a beautiful design. I, I really appreciate it. And you just give me a little bit of explanation about the maker's room. And I, I noticed that in the plan, it is split up into three unequal sized spaces. And I, I just kind of, can you give me a little programmatic um, information on what's going on there? And is that in this room or is it? Mm -hmm. This will be the this room and. Well, and yeah. because like, the staircase that goes downstairs will get swallowed into it, as well as this will and not so, be a stage, and then where the elevator is even, so it'll be so a the access space. will be on that middle level. Yeah. Well, the other thing I, I, I'll point out, too, is where you all, most of you probably walked up to get in, mm -hmm. that's no longer going to be an entrance. That whole yeah, so yeah, left here will become an outdoor patio mm -hmm. that could be an outdoor expanded from, from yeah, the, so we're in here house right house. now. We'll open up essentially this part of this wall out onto this uh -huh. patio yes. area. So that's I mean, some of the idea. some of the programming might be that we want to do something with gardening or plants, and we can be mm -hmm. indoor out mm -hmm. um, with with this space. So maker, what's happening now as far as the maker's room? I know people, <laughs> well, we have, yeah, we have the Fab Lab, which we just bought new equipment using grant funding. Um, so that would be part of this. But I mean, the thing with maker, it's been very, very trendy, I'd say for about the past 10 years. Um, what it was 10 years ago and what it is now is different. You know, so I think the idea is to like make sure that it's a flexible space yeah. for whatever the... the <laughs> Like right now, it's sewing machines and 3D printers, and David um, right. likes. You know, some laser cutting, uh, some some light fabrication components. Um, so I would just add, yeah. So that the Mark has a, a great image up on the screen that uh, allows for section off space there. Um, like 17 would be more sectioned off and separated out. Um, so if we had some private uh, classes or sections that we we needed. Uh, more closed off, there's that ability to do so. And then a, a more multi-use um, generic space would be that section 19, which could potentially be again sectioned off. Um, so it's it's again thinking about the, the future and, and spaces and, and being smart with those spaces 
and being able to provide different spaces for people to do different things. So if we have a class going, we can also still have maybe uh, private uh, sessions for other other functions. Like if we were going to do a multimedia room, we could section that off and have that separated in soundproof and so on and so forth. Um, I think the what exactly is going to go in those spaces is not really clear just yet. Um, we're working with our our staff to figure out, and obviously, you know, the community to figure out what what the needs are. So we, we can't say for certain exactly what would be in that space. Obviously, some of the equipment that was purchased recently, but uh, probably a lot more and expanding upon what we currently have into the future. I think 18 is meant to be storage. So I mean, and at this point, it's storage. But, you know, when we develop, as we learn more, it can become something else. Thank you. Yeah, I think we can't overemphasize the community and put peace on what ends up filling in all these spaces, right? Because it has to be unique to all the Um, You know, and I think every library should be unique to the community. So, you know, a few years ago when Burbank opened a whole big brand new library, being Burbank, being where it is, really close to all the studios, they actually put in a full use editing, green room, like recording studio, like all that stuff, right? Because it, it, it fits there, it makes sense there. You know, our hope is we get enough feedback and input that when we're making those kinds of detailed decisions that we're doing right by Altadena and what the needs of the community are here. And it's a space that can change over time, right? Mm -hmm. So the whole concept of this area is it's basically a space for hands-on learning, mm -hmm. right? So. We've got our library of things where you can check out a telescope. You can check out a, I don't know, sewing machine. Sewing machine. You can like game back. Exactly. So, you know, how are we connecting people with things like that that they can check out and take home? That's what would happen in here. And again, you know, kind of back to your point, it's going to look different 10 years from now and what's going to be available, like commercially to for us, you know, 10 years ago was totally different. So it's hands-on learning, it's it's making and doing things. Um and connecting people to a collection of, of objects or a library of things in a different way as well. Anything in chat that we should look at, David? Um, there was a... Um, so Janet had noted, Janet West had noted that, uh, asked about a drop-off um, for books and stuff for Friends of the Library, a place where they can... Um, Give their donations. I let her know that that's part of the conversation forthcoming with uh, Mark. Yeah. Um, she made a note about needing sidewalks on Mariposa um, so we can walk the library. That makes perfect sense. I don't think we've talked about not having them, so um, that's fine. And then she agreed with the um, the collections, uh, the comment that somebody had made about making sure we don't do away with books in our library. So. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for staying. Yeah, thank you. What a great conversation. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, by the way. Did everybody get to sign up on the email list? We'll we'll share information out with this group as well as the Zoom attendees. We're going to be meeting again on Wednesday. It'll be exactly the same thing, so don't feel any pressure to come again. But we really appreciate your feedback, and this is just the beginning. And how exciting is it? Yeah. Like we're finally getting to do the fun part now. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I have my cards in the back. If anybody wants to take it, if you have any thoughts, feedback, please feel free to email me.